Hello. Welcome to the film section podcast. That was a little that was a little nod right there to the last time I tried to do it like 18 times and screwed it up. I'm Chris. And I'm Mark. And uh tonight we're gonna be talking about uh Taxi Driver for our episode nine here. Uh this is a uh, stray from what we've been doing, so it's it's, it's part of it. It's gonna change up now. We're gonna go. We're going all over the place. So, yeah, get into it. Yeah, um, this is uh, as as I said on the last episode. This is my personal favorite Scorsese movie, um, <clears throat> and uh, this movie's you know pretty old. This movie's nineteen seventy six, so it's one of his earlier ones. Um, it stars uh, Robert De Niro, stars a 12-year-old Jodie Foster, stars Harvey Keitel, um, and a lot of other people, too. Uh, the movie was written by Paul Schrader, and uh, it was made on a budget of $1.9 million. And what's really cool about the movie is that um, so they could make it like a ton of the cast and crew and everyone i think even scorsese himself like all took uh like a pay cut for the movie oh wow i didn't know that i knew you're gonna hit me with the facts here because this is definitely one of your favorites so (laughs) i've i've actually never like really dug into this movie obviously i told you i told you i'd never seen it so Mm -hmm. i've definitely digging so this is going to be all fascinating I mean, this this movie's really, it has a very crazy history, um, because there's also, after this movie came out, there was a man by the name of John Hinckley, who was obsessed with Jodie Foster, and <laughs> planned a assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan in order to impress Jodie Foster. I I mean obviously I knew that this happened but I did not know that was mm-hmm. wow. Yeah, oh, John really? Hinckley saw Jodie Foster in Taxi Driver and was like in order to impress this woman, well this girl actually, she was barely even a teenager. Oh, yeah, like, she, was, she was probably like what was Reagan was like 80, 81, so she was like 16 by then. But yeah. still, man. <laughs> yeah. Um I mean, John Hinckley pled insanity, and so I don't Clearly. think he, yeah, so I don't think he went to jail, but I do think he went to, like, a like a psychiatric center sort of place. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what else. They, what? They, made a movie, they made a movie about the guy that, like, took the bullet for Reagan. I didn't, I didn't know that. Like. It was like an HBO movie. It was it was way it was like early nineties. I forgot the guy's name. Like I feel like an asshole, but he definitely made a movie about the guy because I think he got paralyzed. I'm pretty sure he got paralyzed. Oh probably. shit! I didn't know that. Yeah, um, I was born, I was born like a couple days after that happened. <laughs> what? That's crazy. And then, like. It was at least one or two days after that happened. I remember looking up events that happened when I, like, the year I was born, and that was really close to my birthday, like a day off. Damn. Yeah. It, Crazy. I mean, it's, um, the the movie has a a very almost controversial history, um, Obviously, one with um, the whole John Hinckley trying to assassinate Reagan. Um, yes. And then also, it's it's a movie that is very much a product of its time. Um, when you watch it, there is certain language used, certain slurs that are used, <laughs> certain ways that things are handled. Yeah. Um, uh, like the the fucking Ku Klux Klansman that was selling him guns. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. The movie <laughs> is very much a dirty 1976 New York movie. That guy, like, it's always weird to me because either in a movie that that would feature racism, it's either like you expect it, or they just use racial slurs out of left field, which is what happened in this, dude. Like, I was just like, oh, shit. You got that 
under the arms. He's like a fucking low level arms dealer. He's coming in with the suitcases full of guns. And all of a sudden he's like talking about, he only sells to white people. And he's like jungle bunny this. And (laughs) I was like, well, man, like, it's a, like where did that that just came that shit came out of nowhere yeah, it, it's a very rough movie um most movies of that time are that way dude it's just oh yeah it's just what it was yeah they, they depicted re- most of them depicted realism and i mean sad sadly it, it it's true today and it was fucking super true then yeah like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah um another thing about this movie you know is uh this movie has the very famous you talking to me line that yeah. <laughs> has now become ingrained in pop culture and has been, you know, parodied and everything a million times over now. It's also really funny <clears throat> hearing pieces of dialogue in this movie are used as, like in rap songs and shit. Mm-hmm. Like the part when he's like, he's giving that monologue about the cunts and the losers and the low life. Like, that whole... It was like, here is a man. Like, that whole fucking monologue was, like, the intro to some... I can't... I can't place the song... The song's names, but I remember them being in the songs. Then the part when he's, like, uh, shoots that pimp, he's like, suck on this. And the guy's like, oh, oh! (laughs) I've heard that in a fucking song, dude. Like, yeah, it's very... This movie is super fucking... It's left its mark. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we'll we'll get into it when we get to it. But the the you talking to me line was completely improvised. Um, like not oh, yeah. planned at all. Um, yeah, was, he's looking, he's he's doing that fucking like meet the fuckers face when he's doing it too. So you know it's improv. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a. Uh, it was the end of like they're shooting like that was like one of like the last scenes that they filmed i guess um but uh it was like they were over budget over schedule and like in like an interview martin scorsese said that like their ad came in and was like you guys need to like stop filming like cut it and scorsese was like okay and then, like, they closed the door. Scorsese was, like, filming, like, stand, like sitting underneath Robert De Niro and was, like, just go. And De Niro was, like, you talking to me? <laughs> and um, <laughs> just, yeah, it it's such a cool movie. Um, it's crazy. Well, it's just something, it's just something that was organic that happened and it became, like, this huge pop culture thing. Yeah, it's, oh, my gosh. It's just... It's crazy thinking about it now because it's a movie that when you look at the main character of Travis Bickle, who is the character that Robert De Niro plays, um, the movie is now known as one of these like red flag movies because um, it's one of those movies where like a lot of people seem to not idealize De Niro's character, but are like you know, characters like him or Joker or like Fight Club with like Brad Pitt's character and stuff like that, where, you know, people are like, oh my God, I'm totally like that guy. Where it's like, no, Travis Bickle is like a PTSD, paranoid Vietnam veteran. It, it reminds me of like how people like Scarface. Uh, like they like quote it and this and that. And like, I was like a piece of shit. Like, yeah, there were no redeeming qualities about that character, bro. Like he was a piece of shit, and people are like, "Okay, Ariadne," <laughs> fucking doing their fucking scar quote lines. Like, I want to be Tony Montana. Like, no, what? No, yeah. it's it's just like that. Yeah, definitely. You no, know, I definitely lately with the Joker though. Like, people are people get a little out of it, like, oh, man, I could feel that guy's pain. Like, mm-hmm. yo, no, you can't. It's it's a movie some people can't distinguish, man. I don't understand it. Like, yeah. I think some people see like one problem, like they see something, one thing they can relate to like as a personal problem and then just cling on and be like, hey, I'm like that guy, everything. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's okay. It's okay to relate. Like, mm-hmm. some movies do that. Like, movies have certain things 
so you can relate like people get too crazy like women who are like i want i need a joker i'm harley like no (laughs) you don't want that you want to be in a fucking verbally fucking emotionally abusive relationship and physically with someone that doesn't give a shit about you okay find your joker (laughs) it's yeah it's crazy i want the joker to my harley it's like no you don't because that means that you want to get like beaten up and gaslighted if you really think about it like you don't want it that's not what you want (laughs) yeah no um but anyway so sorry um even so even from the get-go this movie sets itself up as something that um as someone for me you don't see a lot which is there's all these weird close-ups of this taxi cab that's driving mm-hmm. when the opening credits roll and the it keeps cutting between the taxi cab and like this red lighting on robert de niro's eyes and like a rear view mirror yep. and i think it just it shows you already that there's kind of almost like this paranoia that's already in it where Robert De Niro is a very paranoid character. His character of Travis Bickle is very paranoid. And oh yeah. Um he uh like you could tell when like you see it, but you can tell when he's like uh when he goes up to the uh he goes to the guy at the desk at the taxi place and he's like explaining and he's like, no, no, I, I got to work long hours. Like you yeah. can tell that he's trying to fucking swerve his mind from those things that fucking get to him. Like he's, he's, he's trying to be a part of the race and he's like, Hey man, uh, give me long hours. It keeps, mm-hmm. it, it keeps his mind fucking on other things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You can, you see it definitely right in the beginning yeah um so yeah like as you said you know he gets the job at the taxi cab company um and uh and so he's just driving around and we get sort of this narration from him that comes in throughout the rest of the movie um where he gives a very amazing speech but a speech that i don't think i could repeat now um in today's modern era because it's just who it is offensive but uh, yeah he's 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 the guy that guy yeah you know, he's uh he's talking basically about how shitty the city is how how shitty new york city is and how grimy it is and how the people are you know terrible people and i think what is so like awesome about it is that it's the city actually looks gross especially at night the city looks so disgusting everything looks very wet for some reason um everything has like kind of like this almost like green sort of tint to it that makes it feel very kind of dirty and gross it i'm really jealous because when films capture it in this time, it's like, I'm never going to see that for myself. So all I have is these movies. Because yeah. they came into New York and cleaned that shit right the fuck up. So <laughs> yeah. The view and feel of this movie is New York at that time. Like, the slime, the grossness, all that, that, that is very real. Mm-hmm. New York was a disgusting place. You know, the man talking about he was wiping cum out of the back seat, dude. Like, yeah. Oh, the guy that the guy that was uh was asking the questions that have filled out the application. You know that's Joe Spinell. He was maniac. He's the 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 maniac in Maniac. Really, I didn't know that. That's really cool. Yeah, he was. Yeah, what was his fucking name? I forgot his name in the movie, but I'm gonna get yelled at or something by somebody if they ever talk to us. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he's he was he was in Maniac, and uh, he was he until he died. He was uh, Sylvester Stallone. Always gave him. He gave him that little part in Rocky too. Oh, that's really cool. I didn't. I didn't know any of that. I think in the first two Rockies, he's in there. He's like a minor player. Like he plays like. Uh, I think he plays like a Philly mobster that 
that's like friends with fucking uh or just knows Sylvester or knows Rocky or whatever just like mm-hmm. pops up here and there. But yeah. Yeah, that guy. Um that's really cool. Um it, it so... I thought so too. <laughs> yeah, I saw him, I was like, holy shit, man, that's fucking awesome. Um and so it's um it's around that time, you know, after he's kind of talking about how he's wiping like cum and blood off of the back seats. Um, where he's driving around again and he sees this woman, uh, her name in the movie is Betsy and, um, she works for a, like, some sort of like team, like marketing team almost that is trying to get this presidential candidate, uh, Palantine to be like, to get nominated for office. Wouldn't that make her some sort of campaign manager or something? Yeah, it, like it was something like that. Yeah. Um. And so Travis Bickle has like an infatuation with her, and drives by this like campaign office um, every day and like stares at her until one day he finally just comes in and is like, "Go out on a date with me." Um. <clears throat> And so she's like, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> what? This is this is the part I don't understand. Like, uh, you're taking a, a woman on a date. You're like, you're you're going to the you're taking her to the pornos. Well, that was the second date. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah my <laughs> the no. uh, the first date he took her to like some like coffee place. Yeah, um, yeah. And that was when he told her that like. He didn't like her coworker, the guy with like, like the very big fro, um, white guy with a big fro. Um, oh, that guy, that guy, that's Albert Brooks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that guy. You know, he's just like like Mel Brooks's son. Uh, he's but he's the voice of Nemo or Nemo's dad. That's fine. Anyway, so that guy with the, the big fro. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> he's I mean he's like he's kind of a wad in this movie so I'm just gonna refer to him as that guy um the, okay fine <laughs> just saying just saying Nemo's dad just saying yeah that's cool he lost his son bad parenting <laughs> his son almost died on multiple occasions <laughs> Anyways, so that guy is like talking to, or no, um, Robert De Niro is talking to Betsy about how he doesn't like that guy, and is like, you know, over and over, he's saying like, I don't like that guy. His his energy was off, and, and like the vibe between you two just doesn't seem right. But the vibe between us is like, did you feel it? And she's just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's just like, cool. Can I take you on another date? And then. <clears throat> In the narration, he was in. Yeah, well, in the narration, he says that like he had to, he has to take her to a date. She said no. He called her and she said yes. Um, Oh yeah. (laughs) And then that's when he decides to take her to an adult movie theater. Um, and she's like, "Why the fuck do you think I would want to see this?" And he's just like, "I don't know. It it seems cool." He was, yeah, he was, she was like, this is, she's like, are you taking me to a dirty movie? He was like, no, 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 this is, no, this is a good movie. Like, he was, like, he was almost like he was trying to convince himself, like. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that part was fucking strange to me, dude, but. It's really strange. It's, and I think what makes it, I think what makes a lot of this movie so almost uncomfortable because there's you know there's obviously like the skin flicks that he goes to see and then there's a lot of prostitution in this movie with with underage girls and they are just outright talking about how they're underage and i think what makes it so uncomfortable and gross isn't even just the subject matter but it's how they're so uh just nonchalant about it like they don't care it's like yeah whatever this is this is life yeah she's 12 it's fine 
yeah and so it's like i think that that along with the music which i mean the score for this movie is is amazing um this score is fucking fire dude yeah um and i think what's really cool you know filmmaking wise is the like the theme song for this movie that like plays kind of throughout the movie um at a certain point and we'll get to it the the theme song kind of has a whole new meaning where instead of it just being this kind of cool slow jazz song it's really gross like it's contextualized in such a disgusting way that it's like it makes you rethink the movie that now every time this jazz song plays it's really disgusting like you just have a bad thought about it now which again it's, like i think is purposeful it sounds like a clip from music from like a a fucking erotic thriller <laughs> kind of yeah <laughs> but this movie no yes this movie makes it it changes it yeah very um, much yeah and so after um Betsy is like, you're disgusting. I don't want to go to skin flicks with you. Um, yeah, smart person. Yeah, but that's also when we start to see Travis Bickle start to kind of become a little bit unhinged. And I think what this movie does really well is that it's a very slow descent. Yes, yeah, where, I, did. I like that. Where, you know, when we're introduced to him getting, you know, uh, getting the cab job, you're like this guy's kind of funny. He's he's just a lonely guy, but he's kind of funny. Whereas the movie goes on, and you're like, no, this guy is very troubled. Um, yeah. Yep. And so he he drives past uh, Betsy's work a couple more times. He sees Jody's Jody Foster's character walking around in the streets. Who uh, Jody Foster is a twelve year old prostitute in this movie and she was actually 12 years old in the in like in real life too yeah um and it's it's interesting sort of the the weird kind of like tightrope that they play with travis bickle's character because his intentions towards jodie foster are always good like he wants to get her out of it he doesn't you know he doesn't want her to be a child prostitute um but on the same you know or on like the other end he's stalking betsy he's he walks into her work and basically is like like you fucked up and then like yeah. everyone's like you're kind of fucked up like you should probably leave it's a pretty tense scene yeah very sen- tense <clears throat> Um, and so then we get, um, the scene where Travis Bickle, like, officially, like, meets Jodie Foster's character, and also meets Harvey Keitel's character, who plays a pimp. Oh, Harvey. (laughs) I mean, this dude, what a piece of shit, but Harvey Keitel fucking destroyed this role. The small fucking role that he had in this movie, he killed it, dude. He's always long great. Like he's always he always hair, brings it. Long hair, pimp hat ass motherfucker, dude. Yeah. Um named Sport. <laughs> yeah. Um so uh, Travis Bickle talks to Sport, um Harvey Keitel's character, and is like, here's whatever, I think it was like ten bucks or whatever for uh Jody Foster's character they go to a hotel travis so travis bickle now sees where you know these guys go to have sex with the prostitutes and he's like all right this dirty disgusting hotel yeah um and that's when he talks to jody foster's character and he's like you don't gotta do this like you don't have to and she's like i can get out whenever i want and he's like but you really don't have to yeah um and so i'm trying to think um okay and so after that 
when basically it kind of ends in like a weird sort of stalemate between the two where De Niro's like, you don't have to do it. Jodie Foster's character is like, I know I don't have to, but I'm just kind of gonna. And we don't learn for a, a little while after that why she actually is staying. Yeah, this is the part, this part, yeah, when they first meet, basically give plants the seed for him where he's like, she wants to get out, I'm gonna help her. Mm-hmm. And then we, we deal with other things before we deal with that. Yeah, because then at uh, at the 56 minute mark is when um, Travis Bickle is, is buying the guns. <laughs> fucking crazy racist man Mm -hmm. um so yeah he's super racist and he's like i would have you know gone downtown and sold this same gun for five hundred dollars to a very derogatory term and you know a person of color yeah yeah and um and then, you know, he keeps talking to him. And it's interesting at that point because it's at, at this moment where we, as the audience, really see Travis Bickle as uh, not a good person because he, he's, you know, he's testing out the gun, seeing what like, the action is like on him. And he points the gun out the window towards two women, a dog, and a baby. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like... This, you know what? I mean, sure, there's some racism in this scene. I mean, awful. But this scene was very good. It's tense in a way that doesn't, like, try to be. Yeah, like, the guy... It's just the guy explaining every gun, dude. Mm -hmm. So good. Yeah. That was good. And that just that whole scene. Like, dude, all these people in this movie are believable. Like, there's not one person that fucking phones it in in this movie. Unless unless it's the person at the end reading the letter that they wrote to Travis Bickle. <laughs> yeah. That, well, that was it, pretty awful. It's, it's this thing of really none of the characters, or at least a good majority of the characters, are like 100 percent good everyone either lies in that gray area or they're just kind of pieces of shit but there's no good person really right no, no 100 percent good person at least right um and i think this movie does you know just an amazing job of that um yes I so then it's after the it's after the scene where Travis Bickle um, buys a bunch of guns that he goes to some sort of like rally for this Palatine guy yep. and yep. Uh, talks with a Secret Service member and totally like weirds him out. Well, that scene was fucking wacky, dude. It was super weird. Oh, um, wow. Give him a fake give him fake address. Fake dude, name, fake, fake address, yeah. He made that scene that way, dude. Like Oh my god, he was so good. Like De Niro's yeah. acting in this scene especially is just holy shit. Like no one else could do that. There are two ways this scene could have went. He could have had like a legitimate conversation with that guy or what he did. And what he did was fucking like I was like thinking in my head, I was like, if I like I've been in this position and I feel like this guy should just be like, yo, have a nice day, man. You know, I gotta do my job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but no, they kept going, dude. Like it didn't stop. It's <laughs> it's just crazy because it's it's this thing of De Niro is doing such a good job at being so charismatic, yet at the same time being so unhinged to the point where like you feel like he's just about to snap yeah um and to sort of just again to just kind of walk that line between all like it's such a fleshed out 
believable character. You know, that at no point does it feel like a gimmick. At no point does it feel um, fake. Like, it's so realistic. It was, it was at that moment that whatever name he gave, whatever fake name he gave, that he went immediately went on the FBI watch list. Mm-hmm. That yeah. dude was like, "Hey man, uh, listen, uh, I'm gonna need, uh, I'm gonna need some information on a name." Right when he walked away, dude, they mm. they were they saw that shit. We were yep. watching. Yeah, and then um, <clears throat> and so after you know Travis Pickle talks to the Secret Service guy, he goes back to his apartment, and this is where you see full paranoia mode, but you also get the very very famous scene: you talking to me. At one hour, six minutes, and forty one seconds. The, the sick the sick fucking the sick montage of him fucking taping the knife to his boot, uh crafting that crafting that arm holster to where he could fucking just open his hand and the gun pops out of his sleeve, like just loading up the weapons, all that shit. You get that and then just leads you right into the most iconic scene in the movie. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> like just it oh my gosh i mean that it it is you know that is one of the most iconic scenes in cinema history where the very first time i ever heard you talking to me was in hey arnold yeah, they, they they were putting that shit in everything everything yes like hey arnold the nickelodeon show they had hey arnold talking to a mirror saying you talking to me you talking to me <laughs> in a nickelodeon show like that is how far you know and and there's only a handful of movies i think that really transcend pop culture like that you know the shining is one of them taxi driver i think is another you know there is a very small selection of movies that really just are ingrained like that dude regular regular show had ash from evil dead in it well, regular show's a little different, though. Yeah, but it still was on fucking Cartoon Network. You yeah, know what I'm that's true. But regular show was... <laughs> was amazing. It, it was amazing. Don't get me wrong. I love that show. But that show is specifically made for stoners. Dude, oh, for sure. But, my dude, my kids loved it. Dude, it's the only reason, I knew, the only reason I knew about it, dude. My kids wanted to watch it all the time, dude. We watch, like, every episode. It's amazing. It's so good, yeah. Um, yeah, but it's just, you know, it's, but yeah, you talking to me is just one of, you know, the most iconic lines just ever. One of the most iconic scenes ever to, you know, the point where a kid knows that line, that scene, but doesn't know what it's from. Yep. Um, which is just, is insane. And what's even more insane is that 20 minutes later, after that scene, we get the recontextualization of the theme song, where Harvey Keitel is slow dancing with Jodie Foster while he puts on a record that is playing the theme song. And it's while, disgusting. While he's gaslighting her. Yeah. And it's disgusting. Yeah, it's fucking gross like it is so uncomfortable is because filthy. he's basically like he's telling her how much like he loves her and how much she means to him and everything um <clears throat> meanwhile you know the theme song of the of the whole movie the song that's been playing throughout this movie is just playing in the background and you're just like Ugh. like i want to take a shower after that scene <laughs> Whenever things like this happened, I just kept thinking, I gotta get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> get me the fuck out of here. Yeah, <laughs> like it's a scene that you don't want to sit through, and I think Scorsese purposely almost drags this scene out, where it's like, I know you don't want to be here, but you have to sit through it. Yep. Um, And then, it's not very long afterwards that we see uh travis bickle has shaved his head into the very infamous mohawk that i think a lot of people know or when they think of taxi driver they think of robert de niro with the mohawk yeah like uh 
Heroin Bob and FLC Punk. Yeah, yeah, very well. Yeah, yeah, dude. We we get this, and he's a, dude. The Mohawk means he's fucking ready to go, dude. Mm-hmm. Right. So mm-hmm. he goes. He goes to this fucking. He goes to this Palantine rally, and he's watching, clapping, you know, tri- you know doing what everybody else is doing and then the guy comes off the stage and there's this really tense scene that in a normal movie would probably last like five seconds but this lasted at least a minute with it keep cutting to travis and then cutting back to them trying to get the senator guy out he was done with his speech they're trying to get him to the car and get him out and the people are crowding around him and shit and at the last second the guy looks over and sees Travis Bickle reaching his hand into his jacket and he's like, Hey, go get that guy. And they're like, we got to get this fucking dude out of here. And he gets chased out, but the bumbling idiot falls down. And they lose him. Uh, Which, that was, that was intense for no fucking reason. It's super intense because to your point, there's no, there's no release in any other movie. You would have seen Travis Bickle, pulled the gun out and there would have been a shot in yeah. this movie no shot travis bickle fails and goes back home then this is like, then the fucking master plan begins yeah where travis bickle is like all right you know what i'm gonna do instead i'm gonna get jody foster free and just kill all these pimps dude he Dude, the way he runs this scene is fucking crazy. He drives his taxi erratically through the city to where they are. Well, he, he gets... drank and took a bunch of pills. Oh, so yeah, it's yeah. Like he's just he's, not, he's so he far gone at this point. Yeah, he's, washing, he's washing him down with the bruise. He's driving like a fucking madman through the streets of New York, rolls up, does a, does a fucking <laughs> a drive-by fucking park, he, he fucking parks sideways, gets out, walks right up. It's like, hey, sport. Yeah. And they do, dude, this whole back and forth was cool, too. So like, tense. He's like, he's like, do I fuck? He's like, do I know you? Seriously, man, do I fucking know you? He's like, no, you don't know me. Do I know you? <laughs> like, he was just saying nonsensical shit to him. And then, and then, dude was like, get the fuck out of here. Flick the cigarette right in his chest. And fucking dude was just like, suck on this pow. Like, yeah. Oh my God. It happened like out of nowhere. Just, oh, so, oh my God. So good. Just shoots Harvey Keitel straight in the stomach and then walks straight to the hotel. And when he walks into the hotel. He took a break for a second. He took a break for a second. He went and sat on the stoop. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. He does sit on the stoop for a minute, is like, Okay, and then gets up, walks yep. in, walks into the hotel, sees like the really grimy like hotel owner or clerk or whatever, and shoots his fucking fingers off. Yeah, with that fucking elephant gun. With the forty four Magnum, yeah, and yeah, shoots dude. his fingers off. And that scene is like, it's right at that moment that you know that the next ten minutes are just about to be insane. Which that's, that's a well shot scene, dude. What? That's a well shot scene. Oh my god, it's amazing! Like the whole sequence, dude, so fucking good, mm-hmm. so fucking good. Because it's after he shoots the guy's fingers off, um, he goes back to Harvey Keitel, who Harvey Keitel comes into the hotel, shoots De Niro like kind of like nicks him in the neck. Yeah, he got nicked in the neck. Yeah, and De Niro's just like holds his neck while blood is like pouring out. Goes to Harvey Keitel, just shoots him a bunch of times. Yeah, you know, he shot him. The dude went down. Then he made it a point to walk down all the stair, back down all the stairs, walk right up to him, and shoot him a few more times. Mm-hmm. And here's the part I kind of giggled at it, actually. The guy that was with Jodie Foster in the room, like, has a gun, walks directly up to him, and put, basically puts it looked like he put the gun on his arm and shot. Like, yeah. Shot his arm. <laughs> but he so, like, I've never seen anyone get their arm shot like that, where he just walked up and like pressed it on him and was like, bang, here, you fuck your arm. Yeah, really weird. Um, but so De Niro then, you know, goes, kills that guy. Um, 
and then the hotel clerk and um De Niro are in Jodie Foster's hotel room. She's like cowering next to the couch. And De Niro holds the gun underneath the, or like right to like the side of uh, the hotel clerk's head. Jodie Foster's like, wait, don't do it. And he just shoots. No yeah. hesitation. No, like, nope, he's dead. Um, and then for a couple of seconds, De Niro tries killing himself. Um, yeah, the two different guns that had no bullets. Yeah, we're completely out of bullets. So he sits down on the couch, is just holding his neck as like, just waiting to die, basically. Yeah. And then we see the cops show up, um, and that's where we get another very iconic scene of, uh, yeah, of De Niro holding his bloody hand up to his head and just making the gun sign. Um, and then it cuts to... Um, the narration by uh, Jodie Foster's character's parents in the note that they sent him. Um, During Mrs. Steensma. Yeah. Um, and so uh, Jodie Foster's character is Iris. I'm just now remembering that. Her character was oh, Iris. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so there's, you know, there's a voiceover with her dad basically being like, thank you for essentially rescuing our daughter there's all these news clippings of like hero taxi driver like guns down like gangsters and pimps and stuff like that um and so everyone thinks of travis bickle as like this great guy as as this hero um and then it's after that, it's a, I think it's like a couple of months later or something where Travis Bickle is back driving the taxi cab and who gets in his cab but Betsy, the woman who's doing the campaign managing stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And she talks to him and she's like, you know, heard, you know, that you saved uh, or heard that, you know, heard that you're a hero and everything like that. Um, he drops her off. And she's like, how much do I owe you? He gets rid of the fare and drives away. And that's the end of the movie. Yeah. I. What was that? I think he is just, I think he's just super paranoid. Because I, I think the movie ends still with this sense of him being very paranoid. Where he does not trust anyone. Like I, I don't know why I just didn't really get that. Like he he drove that woman, she talked, and then she got out, and he was like, "No charge." Like what what the fuck is what did that mean? I think I, for me, I think it's just a, it's a way of De Niro basically saying like because the way I took it was just he doesn't want the record or the recollection of them knowing he's just a very lonely guy he doesn't trust anyone he's very paranoid he's like no and she might know that you know he wanted to assassinate palentine so it's she kind of seemed like she wanted to say more or she was gonna be like why don't you come hang out and he's basically like knows how dangerous he is so he's not gonna allow himself to get involved in people's shit or get involved with anyone all right well. yeah it just seems like he's you know the loner you know yeah. i'm a loner daddy daddy level yo this movie was so fucking good dude <sighs> yeah i love this movie um let's why you know, why why don't we just get into the likes, I guess? All right. Well let's not let's also not forget that everybody loves Raymond's dad was in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yo, Peter Boyle's the shit, dude. Pretty underrated, pretty underrated guy. He, he does, he's done way, a lot more serious shit. I a mean, lot of more serious stuff in like the you know, in like the seventies and eighties and then it was in like the late nineties, early two thousands when he was doing like Everybody Loves Raymond and Scooby Doo and things like that. Uh, I I 
just about liked everything about this movie. I think I may have liked everything about this movie. That makes me so happy that you love this movie. <laughs> the way it's shot, the way it looks, the acting, the music, everything about this movie is fantastic. I don't know why I waited so long to watch this movie, but I'm glad that I did now. Hell yeah, dude. Um, Man, hell fantastic yeah. Movie. Is I mean the the cinematography and the lighting are uh, are definitely my my number one favorite for this movie because yeah. I do feel like after this, um, I, not that I mean Scorsese's really good at having a different feel for a lot of his movies, but I do feel like Taxi Driver is very one of a kind in that it's the way it's lit. You know where um, there's there's one particular scene where it's um, I think it's like during like one of like the rallies or whatever for Palatine where it looks so warm and like hot outside, mm -hmm. and then they go to Bickle's apartment and it's so dingy and dirty, and the lighting changes just it almost like desaturates to like this very muted green. Um, which for 1976, I can't imagine is easy to light like that. So yeah. just, I mean, just, oh, so great. Um, and then the cinematography, like, as I said, I think just from the opening credits to, you know, with the taxi cab and all the different shots to the way the camera, um, you know, the, the cinematography was so used to make everything feel so lived in and so worn everyone even like so many of like the background characters or anything like that they all felt like like actual people like it felt very real i felt like everyone has been like living a life in these characters which um like the one specific scene that i can think of is um i want to say bickle is like outside of one of like the skin flicks or whatever in this group of like kids slash pimps like walk by him and there's like the stare down between travis bickle and this uh, african-american guy and they're just staring at each other and there's like a red lighting on bickle as he's just is staring this guy down and it's like again like not many other movies aside from joker that kind of ripped that scene off a little bit um and we'll get to that but um, hey also that movie rips off a movie with De Niro, who happened to be the host. The fucking the uh, man, that movie's so good too. Did you ever see that? I'm uh, the King last of comedy. Movie, it's called The King of Comedy. Hell yeah, dude! That is a fucking fantastic movie, dude. I didn't watch that until like last year or the year before either. That's a really good movie. <laughs> Super. Um, uh, yeah. Is there is there anything about tra Taxi Driver that you? maybe didn't like or that maybe just is something that you could have either done without or was like maybe I could change that I don't know I think we maybe could have I, I gave I, I, I gave a special shout to uh, Peter Boyle but I feel like we could have did without the some of the, the, the taxi banter it yeah. wasn't bad, but I feel like if it wasn't in the movie, it wouldn't have been a big deal either. Yeah. Um, I think m my my biggest problem with the movie, and um, it's it's sort of like there's there's certain situations or tense situations that don't necessarily fit. Like there's a very clear thing in the movie where Robert De Niro's character is pretty racist. Um, I think I'm everyone not... in this movie is. What? <laughs> everyone in this movie is a racist, I swear. Well, yeah, but it's like he he seems to have a very like clear problem with like black guys. And yeah, it's he like... calls them anything but black. What? He calls them anything but black. Yeah. That's a clear problem. 
and it's sort of like there's no explanation for it. Um, and I mean, again, it's 1976. I understand that that was still a very, very, very racist point. But it's kind of like, I don't know if, like, I, I get for character development that Travis Bickle isn't a good guy. And so him being racist is, you know, probably just another reason for us to not really like him. But it's kind of like the racism doesn't mean anything because in the end he, you know, kills three white guys. Yeah. So it's like I, I, I just I don't know really what the point of that was. Um, especially if he's like like if he's like a Vietnam veteran, it's like I feel like he would maybe have a problem with like a different race then. Because yeah. of what he would have seen overseas. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I don't know. That that was really the only I, part. I think his racism um it clearly stemmed from that. So when he comes home he just fucking hates anyone that's not white. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably that's honestly probably what it is. It's not like it's not like he's in he's still in Vietnam and he's like, Oh those whatever slurs. Yeah. He, home and it's all different kinds of people so he's like oh look at that and like just takes that with him and but uses this you know what i mean yeah he's he's very like he seems like he's like he puts himself on a pedestal but he's so like socially like just unaware that like there's just this wild disconnect really between him and reality where he's like uh like Come on, get out of here. He, there's that scene when he's like, "I do 50 push-ups a day. I don't put poison in my body." Like he's and like holding his hand over a flame. Yeah, like he's some kind of fucking like above everyone sort of deity, and he's there's like there's nothing wrong with him. Like he's he's like the moral one, but everyone else is disgusting. Yeah. We, yo, I don't think we touched on that scene when. The uh the guy was robbing the store and he just straight up shot that um, man in the store. Then keep going with the weirdness, the store owner's like, I got this, and just starts beating it, beating his dead body with a pipe. Yeah. Takes, takes all the guns. He's like, he's like some kind of fucking mafioso. He's like, I'll clean it up. Like, what? Yeah. What? It's, it's weird. The counter. Yeah. It, what? It, it, it's very much like the underbelly of the city kind of situation, you know, where everyone's just seedy and bad and gross and no one is moral, really. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's a city without morals, um, you know, and like, you know, so what would you rate this movie? 10. 10? 10, 10 out of 10? We got the first 10 out of 10? 10 out of 10. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm giving this a 10. Um, this is, you know, as I said, this is my favorite Scorsese movie. I will, I will say this, even though it's my favorite Scorsese movie, it's not the best Scorsese movie. I, Objectively. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm a really big fan of The Departed. Great movie. Um, what is, he did, he did Goodfellas, right? That to me, objectively, I say Goodfellas is Scorsese's best movie. Oh my god, it's a fucking amazing movie. Um, I think just on a on every level, it's a movie that fires on all four cylinders. Well, so why don't we just get into our favorite Scorsese and De Niro movies then? <laughs> you know, he did fucking Casino too, right? Yeah, yeah, fucking amazing. Um, but I, Goodfellas, I just think is. I think it's it's Scorsese's best movie. I think it's one of the best movies ever made. It's not one of my favorite movies, but I can sit there and say this is one of the best movies just ever made from the storytelling to the acting to the score to the editing to the insane tracking shots to the way the tension you know is built up you know the joe pesci's like funny how it is just one of the most intense scenes 
ever. The you know the narration from uh, Ray Liotta with you know ever oh, since I was little, I always wanted to be a gangster. Like, come on. Yep. Uh, my I'm very sure my least favorite Scorsese movie is uh, The Irishman. My least favorite Scorsese movie. Yeah, would probably have to be The Irishman. And not that that's even a bad movie. It's just my biggest issue is that the last almost hour of it is just pouring. The first three hours, I'm good with. I'm like, hey, this is totally fine. That last hour of 45 minutes, I'm like, all right, wrap it up, De Niro. Let's go. <laughs> what about, uh? no, I don't think this was him, was it? Was it? Did he do Once Upon a Time in America? No. No, okay, good. Um, uh, he did Raging Bull, though, which is an amazing movie. Um, Guess what? Guess what? I've never seen that. Really? Oh, Raging Bull is a great movie. That's him and Joe Pesci. Um, oh, yeah, I know. I, I, like, know of it. It's like this. I know of it. I just never watched yeah. it. Yeah. I don't know. Jake um, Lamont. What? That's Jake LaMotta's story. Oh, uh, yeah. Um... You mentioned The Departed, which was is that's I such a good it. movie. I love that movie. I love it. So great. Um, yeah. You know the fucking Dropkick Murphys playing like every like ten minutes is amazing. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, the end of the movie where spoiler alert for anyone that hasn't seen it, where just everyone fucking dies is awesome. Um, <laughs> Is so great. Um, the acting, I mean, that's another movie that just has like, amazing acting. You know, that's one of Nicholson's last movies. Um, you know, DiCaprio, Damon, Baldwin, Wahlberg, all killing it. Yeah, fucking, yeah, Nicholson doesn't do shit anymore. Well, he retired from acting. He goes to the fucking Lakers games. Yeah. I mean, he can I mean, good for him. He doesn't need to act anymore. Yeah, he does. He's got to be. He's come back and be the Joker again. It's an old Joker. Oh well, I mean, you know, all that's like in his eighties, dude. All, hey, all that stress from getting chased by Batman. You're gonna look older. He's in his eighties. I don't think he can do it. He's fine. He looked like he was eighty in nineteen seventy, dude. Come on. <laughs> he's like... Um, is there? I mean, well, you mentioned Casino, which, you know, another great movie. Um, I remember my, my, uh, I think my brother's favorite movie is probably Goodfellas. Either Goodfellas or Casino is, I know, my brother's favorite movie. And so growing up, you know, I would watch, you know, those kind of movies with him a couple of times. Yeah. Um, And it's, I think Scorsese is interesting because he's a filmmaker that, for the most part, especially with movies like Goodfellas and Taxi Driver and stuff like that, it's they are very adult movies, and I don't mean and, and and I mean I mean adult in the way that like I don't think kids would even enjoy them. You know, yeah. where you can watch a rated R movie and a kid will enjoy it because it's violent or scary or something. These are just I don't think a kid would. They wouldn't know. They would. It's it's adult themes, dude. Like they wouldn't know. They wouldn't know how to react or relate to what any of these people are saying or doing. Like yeah. it's it's adult situations. Like yeah, grow up and know things about the world to appreciate movies like this. You know. Yeah. Like you, you had to have some experience in your life, or not, or more knowledge because it's yeah. definitely. I remember being a kid and like. I'd watch just about anything, but then there were movies that were like absolutely for adults because I was like, mm, "This you just see it and you're just like, well, that's not for me." Like, yeah, I like it. You don't get it, you know what I mean? So, yeah. like, it's boring. I mean, I'm not gonna yeah, lie. Like, oh, what a boring ass movie! And then you grow up and everybody's like, "Oh, this movie's great, great!" And then you watch it, and you're like, "Oh yeah, I guess it was pretty good." Yeah, because <laughs> I understand. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yeah, that's pretty much what it is. Um... <clears throat> Another thing about specifically Taxi Driver is um, 
Taxi Driver has been ripped off or homaged so much in the 40 plus years now that it's been out. 45. Yeah. Um, and the biggest one I would say is is Joker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, Joker captured the feel there. And specific scenes. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, you know, it's, don't get me wrong, Joker is one of my favorite, is, I don't want to say one of my, one of my favorite movies of 2019. Um, but it is this thing of when I watch Joker, and then when I go back and I watch Taxi Driver, I'm like, okay, you have sort of the empathetic villain, you have the, um, you have the color palette, <laughs> you have certain shots like where in Joker, there's the clown guy in the taxi that drives by Joker, and Joker just the same exact camera movement, Joker mm-hmm. stares down the guy in the clown mask, where in Taxi Driver, it was Robert De Niro staring down the the one of the pimps. Yeah. You know, it, just things like that. Literally down to, you know, as, as I said, the color palette. I think, you know, there's even, um, like, just the, like, just almost some of, like, the, the mannerisms of Joker, when he's not sad, he's, his smile is very, like, charismatic and scary. Where same with Travis yes. Pickle, where when Travis Pickle is smiling, is very charismatic but scary. Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely a lot taken from this movie for the Joker, for sure. Yeah. Um. So, what kind of movie? I guess would you? What kind of genre? Um, would you like to see Scorsese go after? Because he sort of did horror with Shutter Island, which, you know, is a great movie that I love. I love Shutter Island. You've never seen Shutter Island? No. You would really like that one. That would be... That would be Maybe I should watch it, but from what I, like, gathered, I just, it, I had no interest. I don't know why. I think you would really like it. It's DiCaprio and uh, Mark Ruffalo. Paul the Hulk, isn't it? Yeah. My man. Um, it, it's just, it's really good. It's not, it's not scary, but it is a very psychological thriller. Okay. okay. Um, but, you know, like, what, but what kind of movie, uh, you know, would you like to see Scorsese sort of tackle next? Or even Scorsese and De Niro combo again? I want to see a Scorsese, Scorsese comedy, bro. I want to see some. I want to see some yuck yucks from Scorsese. <laughs> I don't know what his comedy. I don't know, is. dude. Like honestly, I don't know because I feel like he's hit every beat. Well, almost every beat. Like his movies are pretty dramatic. So, like, I can't really say can you do a can he do a like a straight drama? Like, I can't really say that because his movies have themes of like everything in them. Yeah, I don't think. He, really classify them unless it's like goodfellas or casino those are like fucking gangster crime thrillers what i would kind of say wolf of wall street is kind of a comedy it's like kind of a crime comedy it's very over the top in its way yeah um funny yeah um you know and then there's i guess horror with like cape fear that's another really good movie yeah. Um, if you like Cape Fear, then you'll like Shutter Island. Even though fucking Nick Nolte sucks balls. <laughs> I, I don't like Nick Nolte. I just don't I, like I don't like his voice. I can't stand his voice. I fucking, I feel like I hate everything that Nick Nolte's in. Yes, his voice sounds like he smokes four packs a day. Oh my god. It's just or, it's like, awful. or like somebody that went to a concert and yelled a lot, and then the next day they talk, and that's what he sounds like. Yeah. It, oh my God. It's just. I, it's hate him. I just. I don't like him in anything. No. 
Um, no, I don't like Nick Nolte. To be completely honest, I, I, I like Cape Fear, but that's probably on, like, the bottom of my list of Scorsese movies. Yeah. Yeah. It's mostly because of Nick Nolte for me. Yeah. Um, I mean, De Niro's great in it, but I don't think, you know, um, I don't know. It's just, for me, it's, it's sort of not that memorable, especially compared to his other movies. It reminds me of look a lot in the in the same look as um what's that movie with fucking <laughs> they tried to make that horror movie with John Lithgow raising Kane. Never seen it. Oh uh, yeah, well if you saw it or watched the trailer, like that and Cape Fear like look like they were shot by the same person. <laughs> the, it was just this look of like late eighties, early nineties, like thriller type deals. Mm-hmm. And they the same and i specifically remember those two looking exactly the same it's just weird um yeah i mean it's hard to say it really is hard for me to say like what genre would i like to see him tackle because i feel like he tackles multiple genres in each of his movies you know what i mean yeah um i think i'd like to see scorsese um I was going to say, I'd like to see him tackle a slasher. Like a straight up, like, a sl- like I'd like to see Scorsese do a Friday the 13th movie and s- just see what that's like. Imagine if, imagine if all the, with all that shit he talked, what if he did a superhero movie? See, that I can't see. <laughs> exactly. And not even, not even because he talks shit about it, just because I don't see how... It's like with Friday the Thirteenth, I could see him making it a lot more psychological, but with superhero movies, I can't see it. What about Batman? He should do Batman. I could see him doing Batman, but told from like the side of like Carmine Carmine Falcone or something. Like he he would do a really good job at like the Long Halloween. Hear me out. out. He should do a Batman movie, but from. The perspective of the Gotham Police Department. Police Department. That would be good. I think that would be yeah. kind of cool. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I could see that. That would be cool. That would be pretty badass. I think. I think that would be pretty good. Like Batman would be in it, but like you know how they do with the fucking, like, what did they do? Oh, with Gotham. Like there were villains, but it was mostly the cops. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the focus on the cops, not so much on like Batman being Batman and all that stuff. Yeah, like, I think he could seriously do something like that, as far as that goes. But I don't see him doing like a fucking Captain America. No, no. If, if he did, like, if him or somebody really prominent did something like that it would have to be a different perspective it couldn't just be like hey put a guy in the suit he's a big 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 hero yeah um would you i don't i mean he's kind of done this where like he's like remade movies but would you like what kind of movie would you like to see scorsese remake with de niro in the lead wow interesting question uh (laughs) <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Yo, what a... <laughs> about Silence of the Lambs? De Niro's Anthony Hopkins character? Yeah. <laughs> Why not? That could be cool. Why not? That could be cool. Um I think now that he's older he could he could really do it. Yeah. Um, I like to see, um, I like to see Scorsese remake, <laughs> I'd like to see Scorsese remake The Exorcist with De Niro as one of the priests. Yeah, Demon, you talking to me? <laughs> I don't see anybody else here, you must be talking to me. Uh, House on the Haunted Hill would be kind of cool, actually. Uh, yeah, dude. What about uh, if he could he remake uh, Halloween Kills? 
goes. I, yeah. I still haven't seen Halloween Kills yet. Could he remake that? Because it wasn't very, it wasn't good. Oh, I'm sorry. Why? Why haven't you seen it, Mark? I don't know. I've been busy. I need you to feel my pain. I know. I've just been busy. Um, yeah, I think. Um, actually, fuck yeah, I want to see Scorsese remake House on the uh, House on the Haunted Hill now. That is a pretty fucking great choice. Yeah, I oh, would. Oh, that'd be so good. That would be pretty fucking great. I will second that. And I would like to see De Niro. I don't want De Niro to play Vincent Price's character. I'd want him to play Watson Pritchett, the, like the alcoholic who was like convinced the house was haunted. I want De Niro yeah, to play that character. I want, um, I want Jeffrey Combs to be a, be Vincent Price. Jeffrey Combs. Yeah, he's Herbert West, the animator. He's he's a really good actor. What did yeah. you said, Jeffrey Combs? Yeah. Why can't I think of it? He's reanimator. Oh, oh, okay. I didn't hear that. Um, he actually does a really good, like, he does a really good Edgar Allan Poe. That'd be cool. He played Edgar Allan Poe in The Black Cat, like, on multiple occasions. Like, I think it, it was like a running thing on Masters of Horror. They had the Black Cat segment, and he was Edgar Allan Poe. And then I believe he did it like on Broadway too or something and he's like really good um so last question and then we'll probably wrap this up but what who's one actor or actress that you would like to see work with Scorsese that like hasn't worked with him yet um, Adam Driver He'd be good. He'd be really good. Mm-hmm. Maybe uh, wait, I don't know. Is this is this right? Maybe Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy would be well. Dude, that movie with Tom Hardy and fucking James Gandolfini was fire, dude. The drop. Oh, so good. That's that such a good movie. If I, I pick him, if I pick him because Scorsese tends to go like gangster. So mm-hmm. like you can do um, hard in there. So funny story about the drop. It took me almost it took me a couple of weeks to watch that movie. Um reason being is um I was I was dating this girl at the time and so her and I like every night we kept starting it because we were like we have to finish this movie and for some reason we just kept falling asleep not even not that like we didn't like the movie but we just kept falling asleep yeah so it wasn't until probably like two weeks or three weeks later after we've kept trying to watch this movie that we finally sat down and i remember like watching it and looking over and being like when the fuck did he get a puppy like at like two and a half weeks in. <laughs> oh boy. Um yeah. Tom but yeah, Tom Hardy uh Tom Hardy would be good. Um I'm trying to think who who I'd like to be in it. Um honestly I want to see Adam Sandler be in a, in a Scorsese movie. I think he can do it. After Uncut Gems, I think Adam Sandler can do it. <laughs> okay. Yo, I mean, a few years ago, I would have laughed at you. I mean, I'm laughing now because <laughs> it, was, it was out of left field. But uh, it, after Uncut Gems, yeah, I think he could pull it off. You know, I think if, if, if he played um, – Say you did a movie about like say Scorsese did a movie about like horse races, like horse race gambling and like that whole life. I think Adam Sandler would do a really good job as like a very intense bookie. Almost like the opposite role that he took in Uncut Gems, where he was like a very intense bookie that like was just unhinged. But in that movie, but in Uncut Gems, he was a very intense gambler. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That 
was going to kill the weekend. <laughs> I don't think he was going to kill him. I think he was just going to try to, um, you know, fuck him up a little. Yeah, he was going to try, all right. Yeah. No Taylor's taking the weekend out. Oh, my uh, gosh. Fucking, I like your shirt, dude. Oh, hell yeah, dude. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll talk about what this means at some point. I just, I just kind of noticed it, and I was like, "Oh yeah, I like that." Yeah, yeah we're gonna, talk, we'll t- we're gonna touch on that. That's coming soon. That's a little. There's a little teaser for you. Yeah. It's coming soon. A couple more um, episodes. We're gonna get right into that. Yeah, dude. Um. So next week, what do we got for next week? Oh, uh, cruising. A little William Friedkin joint. I've never little, seen that, so this should be exciting. Director of The Exorcist, starring Al Pacino. Um. It is much, it's very um, dirty and gross a lot. Like, it's, the, the, the look of it is a lot like Taxi Driver. Okay. I feel like these two movies will complement each other pretty well, so. Awesome. Um, yeah, so it should be fun, and it's awesome that you never saw this, so now you're going to be seeing it for the first time, and I'm pretty excited for that. Yeah. Uh, we made it to episode nine, guys. We're going to see you next week for episode ten. Remember. Nope. Like, comment, yeah. comment, <laughs> comment, talk to us, follow us on Twitter, follow the YouTube channel. Come on, come on. So, <laughs> I mean, people are watching, I know that, but if those some of those people could talk, that would be even better. Just say something, anything. <laughs> we got we got one comment on uh, on one of our videos. You did what they yeah. say. Um, it was on our uh, our house's October built video um, where they said like the characters in the movie were assholes <laughs> <laughs> and I was like aww uh, yeah kind of I mean I see it I see it <laughs> um, I think my mom commented and she was like you guys are so entertaining I was like thanks mom so thanks Stick around for the dick stabbing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I hope we're I hope we're still entertaining then. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. Oh, so, so that's oh episode. Right, yes. yes, next week cruising. And uh as you can see we're having way too much fun, so we're gonna get out of here. <laughs>